Welcome, my dear friend. And I want to share with you today something about what we will call prayer of the heart. Let us begin in prayer. Unto the glorious and undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be everlasting praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. Well, my dear friends, what is the prayer of the heart? Well, we will begin by um, uh, taking a journey to the early tradition uh, of the church, where we can discover through early writers and scripture what it means. It's a big subject, but I will try to uh, uh, sketch out um, as best I can what the prayer of the heart means for you and for me. In the first centuries of Christianity, thousands of men and women went into the desert as a symbol of their interior poverty. Their prayer style was simple and direct. A few phrases from scripture repeated over and over till they became part it, that prayer became part of their breathing and heartbeat. And if you think about it, um, um, our, our faith is an incarnational one, so that is meaning that um, we share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. It's based, so that means, the material and earthly realm are not separate, but are wedded together uh, by God's uh, overflowing grace. And so that means our body, our physical body, as St. Paul says um, in uh, his first letter to the Corinthians, you should know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and uh, that you receive this from the Lord and that God therefore dwells in you. So the more we allow God to dwell within us, the more we become Christ-like, the more our image, may, as we are made in the image and likeness of God, is restored to what it was in the beginning of creation. So that the new Adam, Jesus, our Saviour, brings about a coming together of the material and the spiritual. In, so that means I worship God with my, not only, um, I worship God with my body so that my breathing and my heartbeat are very much part of what prayer is. And the early writers, uh, spiritual writers, um, developed this and meditated upon this reality. From the 4th century onwards, um, various famous writers, uh, Macarius, Evagrius of Pontus, Cassian, St. John Climacus, and so on. And uh, they, uh, as I said a moment ago, they um, understood that uh, uh, an effective prayer, that's a sigh of love from us to God, a short prayer, it's based on um, from scripture focuses and directs ourselves Godward. And uh, the writings of these masters of this form of prayer 
um, were collected in a book called the Philokalia, and uh, which uh, is a distillation of the various writings of the early fathers upon how to pray with the breath and the heartbeat. You see, we take it for granted, don't we, that um, we need oxygen to keep our, ourselves physically alive. Our body needs oxygen, the breath of, literally the breath of life. And spiritually speaking, if we are uh, temples and we are the, of the Holy Spirit, we allow the breath, we want to allow uh, the in-breathing of the Spirit of God to take um, to take our material body uh, so that it becomes more transformative into that which God desires. So let's talk about what is commonly known in the East particularly, but is being discovered anew in the Western Christianity, um, the Jesus Prayer. Now, this is one form of prayer that, that um, means that it follows our breath, breathing in and breathing out. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy upon me. And uh, so it's not some magic formula it's not some kind of incantation. It's grounded in Scripture. And, uh, we, and I'll read the passage from St. Luke's Gospel where we understand how this prayer came about. And Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves and that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. Or, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And uh, also, Later in St. Luke's Gospel, when we hear the, we read the account of blind Bartimaeus at Jericho, he, he never stopped shouting out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And you see elsewhere in Scripture, in the Gospels, our Lord gives examples of the man and woman who persistently repeats and cries out the same phrase of petition and love until he or she is heard. This is a testimony. This persistence is not giving up, a testimony of their faith. And this form of prayer, which follows our breathing and our heartbeat, is called the prayer of the heart. It's a twofold movement. I breathe in, I breathe out. It is a petition to God's divine compassion, and it's also an adoration. 
of divine love. It's Trinitarian. And this, Jesus shows us in the Gospel, his words, they're words of reconciliation, of forgiveness, and justification of, of the unworthy sinner through the overflowing of God's grace, the overflowing of God's breath, the temple that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit by which we are renewed and transformed. When, I re when we repeat uh, a form of effective prayer, though, or sometimes called an arrow prayer, this short petition of love over and over again is not some kind of incantation. It's a determination and a constancy as those who cried out to the Lord in the Gospels to be healed. And in the Church's public worship in her liturgy, does she not also repeat Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Over and over again, all the sanctus. Sanctus, 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 dominus, Deus, sabaoth. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. And if the angels of heaven cry out repeatedly in praise and adoration, we can understand that crying out to God repeatedly in our mind or upon our lips, then we will descend into the heart. And there we will find rest and stillness. But it does require us to realize that it is a commitment and a discipline. Well, <clears throat> but there are many. So the Jesus prayer, as it is well called and known, implores our Saviour to, to show us his, to reveal and show us and give us his mercy. And the more we rely upon the love and mercy of God, the more we are inwardly renewed and purified. Um, so to go back to some of the earlier teachers, of this uh, of prayer and, and this tradition. We see, for example, Cassian, John Cassian, who wrote his book of conferences or instit and institutes, and he lived um, from 360 AD to 435. You see, quite early on in the early church, and he... Uh, went to the deserts uh, to, um, to gain uh, wisdom from the early uh, fathers and mothers of the desert, those who were practicing this simple, direct prayer of the breath and of the heart. Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. When we uh, wish to draw near to Jesus who loves us, we must come to him in a state of utter dependency, for we, we can do nothing without him. It is only sin that uh, separates us 
or impairs our relationship with him. But even though we cry out that we are sinners, that very cry uh, uh, uttered with sincerity gives us his peace and forgiveness. And this has been the teaching of the fathers from the beginning of the Christian, uh, Christian tradition. Let us look, for example, at Cassian's record of the second conference of Abbot um, Isaac on prayer. So Abbot Isaac was one of the Desert Fathers whom Cassian um, has, um, who gained much um, of his uh, information amongst other teachers. Abbot Isaac says, For then will be perfectly fulfilled in our case that prayer of our Saviour in which he prayed for his disciples to the Father. When that perfect love of God, wherewith he first loved us, has passed into the feeling of our heart as well, by the fulfilment of this prayer of the Lord, which we believe cannot possibly be ineffectual. And this will come to pass, when God shall be all our love, our every desire, wish and effort, every thought of ours, and all our life and words and breath. And that unity which already exists between the Father and the Son, and the Son and the Father, has been shed abroad in our hearts and minds, so that he, so that as he loved us with a pure and unfeigned and indissoluble uh, love, so we also may be joined to him by a lasting and inseparable affection, since we are so united to him, that whatever we breathe or think or speak is God, since, as I say, we attain to that end of which we spoke before, which the same Lord in his prayer hopes may be fulfilled in us, that they all may be one as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they also may be one, made perfect in one. And again, Father, those whom thou hast given me, I will that where I am they may be also. This, I say, is the end of all perfection, that the mind purged from all carnal desires may daily be lifted towards spiritual things until the whole life and all the thoughts of the heart become one continuous prayer. And later on, um, Cassian records uh, Abbot Isaac's saying of, um, the following. And this was delivered to us by few of those who were left of the oldest fathers. So it is only divulged to us, to a very few, and to those who are really keen and so for keeping up continual recollection of God in this pious formula is ever to be set before you. O God, make speed to save me. O Lord, make haste to help me. For this verse has not unreasonably been picked out from the whole of Scripture for this purpose. So we see in the early tradition, drawn of course from scripture itself, that petitionary prayer, that effective prayer, repeated over and over again, such as Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy upon me, or as I've just met, quoted from uh, Abbot Isaac, 
O God, make speed to save me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Repeated over and over again, goes from the head to the, oh, sorry, goes from the lips to the head and then to the heart. A three, uh, so in, the, in a sense, in a way, that movement, head, lips and heart, of course, it mirrors the action of the one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So, the breath prayer. When you um, set aside time for private prayer, I mean to be alone, because prayer is never private, of course. When you set aside time to pray, you need time, of course, to uh, come in a state of relaxation, to still yourself, to recollect yourself, and by repeating over and over again, conscious that you are saying this prayer um, and following your breath, O oh God, make speed to save me, breathe in, O oh God, make haste to help me, breathe out, for example then not only are you a more focused, but interiorly you are still. That is that the prayer of the lips and the head descends to the heart. But of course we have to constantly um, repeat over and over again these effective arrow prayers so that they then become in a, in a way a uh, part of our unconscious life so that the material and the spiritual are increasingly uh, not separate but joined One early writer said the following, sit yourself down in a quiet room, in a remote corner, and do what I tell you. Close the door, raise your spirit above every object that is vain and passing, then lean your beard upon your chest, turn the gaze of your bodily eye with all your mind towards a place of the heart, where all the faculties of the soul reside. At the beginning you will find darkness and impenetrability, but if you persevere, if you do this day and night, you will find a happiness without end. And the same author says, you know that your breathing is the inhaling and the exhaling of air. The organ which serves for this air is passing, so, uh, serves for this, is the lungs which lie around the heart, so that the air passing through them thereby envelops the heart. Thus breathing is a natural way to the heart, and so, Having recollected your mind within you, lead it into the channel of breathing through which the air reaches the heart. And together with this inhaled air, force your mind to descend into the heart and remain there. There you are. So remember, my friend, that repeating a prayer of love 
based upon or from scripture is part of the early experience, the Christian experience of worship and a private prayer, that is, prayer alone, uh, in particular, but is also illustrated in a way by the public liturgy of the church in a certain formulas that are repeated. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. And that persistence, that re repetition, is not some su superstitious formula, but it is a it, it is a prayer that pierces the heart, that is, so that my love is directed to the object of its love. And as we see in scripture, the one who cries out persistently to the Lord, the Lord turns to, lays his hand upon them, and heals them with his love. It is a testimony of faith. Testimony of love. Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy upon me. O God, make speed to save me. O Lord, make haste to help me. There you are. Remember, as I said at the beginning, our faith is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, so that all of all who you are, body, mind and spirit, are a unity. We pray with our body. We pray, therefore, with our lips. We pray with our mind. We pray with our affections. We pray with our hearts. And then we can understand the transforming action of divine grace within us. There has been a tendency sometimes in Christianity to adopt what we call a dualistic mentality to see that everything that is material and bodily is evil or sinful. But the sin is our doing, it's not God's doing. We are created and made in the image of God. In all you are and I am is imprinted, as it were, stamped, as it were, with the image of, of God. We, so it is not our human flesh is... Uh, transformed that we may be able to receive the divine light of God's indwelling love to be restored to our original nature. Thank you for listening. I hope I I haven't uh, <clears throat> wandered and strayed too much in my points and I hope that what I have shared with you today may be helpful. Unto the glorious and undivided Trinity, unto the sacred humanity of our crucified Lord Jesus Christ, the everlasting praise and glory now and forever. Amen.